I will jump into the introductions. So uh, this is Bryce Cheney. I'm a senior vice president at MarketBridge. Uh, I support our clients across all of our verticals. So technology, financial services, media, as well as other consumer. I have about 15 years of go-to-market strategy ex expertise, uh, sort of broadly, uh, though a focus of that has largely been on analytics and sales operations and, and, and strategy. And so the discussion today is really, I'm excited for it because it's kind of merging those two particular focus areas of mine. I am joined today by our CEO, Tim Fury, and I'll have him introduce himself. Good day, it's Tim Fury. I'm CEO and founder of MarketBridge affectionately known by my sales team as non-quota bearing overhead. So I'll let Bryce take it from, from here and I'll chip in where I need to. Okay, so, so let's walk through what we're doing here. Um, I assume Bryce, you want me to take it from here? You, you got this, Tim, and I'll take it from here. Okay, just wanna make sure. So we've been putting a series together of um, what we call the revenue reboot on how companies coming out of the COVID crisis, et cetera, can reboot revenues. And we've been looking at everything from buyer experience to cross-selling to retention. In this case, it's looking at sales channels. And we have one more uh, around sales enablement in a couple of weeks. Uh, all these are recorded and most of them have blogs and some level of white papers behind them. Um, mostly because our clients that we're working with every day are really struck by how they have to make changes coming out of uh, this pandemic, um, they probably are doing many changes, as you're going to see, that were happening anyway um, from a customer buying behavior, but they're just being accelerated. So today we're going to talk about geographic-based sales models and, and how that's changing. I think really three lessons come out of today. Uh, number one, as I just said, uh, we have really been seeing the slow, I wouldn't say decline, but I would say the slow attrition of geographic-based sales models over the last 10 years. Um, I wrote a book God, 15 years ago on uh, channels and how channels work together. And back then we used to say, ch channels don't choose customers, customers choose channels. Um, but even today, when you get to the point where you're doing geographic-based sales territory, you're essentially choosing the customer. You're not letting the customer always choose the channel. And what's happening with COVID, as everybody knows, is a lot more people are doing uh, online events and web searching and all that stuff. And we'll show you some data on that. Uh, but COVID is just going to amplify this more. And the ability to have face-to-face -face meetings, local meetings, et cetera, for sales reps is going to get harder and harder. We have outlined three stages of what we think companies need to do to respond to this. Um, one is short-term territory rebalancing. We'll get into that, but how certain territories are going to have customers in those territories that are going to be uh, severely affected by COVID and the pandemic. Others are going to have companies that are actually being boosted. We are seeing a lot of our tech clients. We have a ton of tech clients, and a lot of our tech clients are actually doing very well through the period, and so they're trying to find out how they need to rebalance their territories and how the people that serve them to say, okay, these, these geographic territories around, for example, Silicon Valley are humming versus somebody um, in the manufacturing sector may not be humming. So we'll talk about territory rebalancing. We'll talk about what we call structural enablement. We don't like the term sales enablement the way most people define it. And then we'll talk about how you adjust coverage in what may be a geographic based uh, territory model and then finally, um, we want to introduce the concept that we've been working with several companies on, which is what may be dynamic territories, where you don't even set territories on an annual or quarterly basis. You literally are on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, uh, redefining people's territories based on AI and algorithms. And we'll talk about that a little bit toward the end. Um, just quickly. In the B2B market, as well as the B2C market, um, sales channels have got to respond to buyer change. We've all seen the decline in um, usage of field sales uh, during COVID-19, 65% according to some numbers. Um, some of that will come back, uh, a lot of it won't. Uh, that doesn't mean there's still not a need for field sales reps and inside sales reps, but we're training customers across more and more industries that uh, they don't necessarily need to always engage with a human being. 
And obviously that helps by having the technology such as Microsoft Teams and all these things that are, that are making it much easier for people to do more of their buying process online. So none of this is new to anybody. What's interesting, um, and I believe this is some data from McKinsey, is that this trend has already been happening well before we had any uh, sort of downturn uh, from 2016 to 2019. Already people were moving their buying behavior uh, more toward digital channels and, and non-face-to-face -face channels. So we all know that. The, the challenge that we're going to talk about here is that um, if, if those of you who have read many business books, a book was written 15, 20 years ago by Clay Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. And the challenge is if you're going to innovate on your sales model and come up with a new coverage model that's sort of uh, beyond geography, uh, the challenge is all of our systems, everything we do, our compensation plans, our CRM systems, our, everything we do is still based on a geographic model for lots of companies. So while the concept of a geographic model um, going away is great, the actual execution of it is really, really hard because customers may be moving away from needing a local rep, but companies are still organized around geographies and you don't just turn that off overnight. Uh, so there's a real challenge coming through for lots of people to try to, ha to try to make this transition from heavily geographic aligned sales channels to ones that are much more dynamic and uh, aligned around customer needs. So I'll pick, let Bryce pick it up from here and we'll come back and show you some examples later of what we mean by dynamic territories. Yeah, and just quickly uh, to orient on, on sort of the basic characteristics of a geographic territory, which really isn't too much news to anyone, but really two things to highlight. The first is you're obviously taking a geography and you're, and you're segmenting it out. So here you have four different geographic territories. You got a Northeast, a Northwest, a Southeast, and a Southwest. That's obviously the standard. But perhaps more importantly, when you do that, almost all of these models, and while there are variants of them, almost all of them have this territory rep as the hub. Um, so that, that rep is the recipient of leads um, regardless of their how the leads are created, that rep acts as the sort of the only recipient of leads for that geography. And then also acts as the hub for actually working deals. So overlays and support specialists and renewals and any, any number of things basically work off of that lead. And, and essentially what you've done is you've, you've said that the geography is the defined specialization. Um, and historically, that makes a lot of sense. There's a number of advantages here, right? It's, it's the simplicity of operation. It's pretty clear. That's largely driven by the fact that this is just universally understood. It's been 100 years uh, and it's certainly just accepted generally. Uh, I think the most important element, though, in, in stating that the geography defines the specialization is this idea that the face-to-face -face relationship uh, was so important. Uh, and obviously, Tim walked through a number of trends, and, and we all know how those are changing, where we have fewer moments of truth face to face. And so the importance of that is, is being called into question. So as we think about the, the geo territories, there's obviously it's the foundation for the majority of companies we work with. There's obviously a number of advantages. But there's really three disadvantages that we see. And these are disadvantages before COVID, but they're certainly being amplified uh, during the current current disruption. On the left here, what we call lead bumpiness. This is where you, you, may, have, you may have segmented your territories perfectly, done a, a very in-depth TAM analysis, and, and each territory has the same amount of TAM. But then when you start executing, you have just wildly different uh, sort of lead flows. And there's a number of drivers to that. There's a number of things we can't capture within sort of typical territory segmentation. When we think about the COVID disruption, um, it's really stated a number of sort of winners and losers from an industry standpoint, as Tim alluded to. There, there, some industries have uh, tailwinds, whereas the majority are facing headwinds, and it's very different. So uh, you may have a rep uh, in the in the Midwest who is typically focusing on manufacturing, who has a fairly dry pipeline right now, uh, whereas a rep in the Northeast uh, or in the or in Silicon Valley uh, may have a fairly robust pipeline still. And so you obviously have a huge territory imbalance, which can lead to a number of inefficiencies. The second issue is what we call opportunity context misalignment. And this is really getting to the core of uh, 
is a generic rep what's necessary or do we want to make sure that we have the right leads with the right context going to the right resources and so if you think about every time a lead is created there is some context behind that there is information around what they're interested in there's information about their industry uh, and, and typically the seller expertise or industry knowledge is the best way to address that um, but in many models by organizing around geography, we're sort of eliminating, aligning the best expertise or knowledge to that opportunity up front, uh, which can lead to multiple handoffs in the sales process, uh, lengthy sales processes, et cetera. And so that's that's another issue that's being amplified right now. And just to add, what we're seeing right now is customers are getting more and more frustrated with multiple touch points, multiple overlays, and they want to go to the expert right away. They expect to see somebody who's a vertical or product expert right away and not have to necessarily go through several people before they get to, to somebody who can answer detailed questions quickly. But we'll come yep. back to that later. Yep. And the third one, perhaps a little less relevant to today, but still still important to call out is what we call opportunity conversion misalignment. And this is this is really where you have a misalignment between the value of, of an opportunity or a deal and the cost to secure it. Um, typically, this is solved by segmenting the market and aligning you know, your field resources, your teller resources, you know, your digital sales, et cetera. But in times like this, you often see reps chasing the wrong deals. And so this is a, just another issue that gets amplified even within the segmentations that you've already established. So with all of that being said, there's, there's, just, there's a number of questions that our clients and sales executives are being you know, confronted with, which is if, if local presence is as necessary as the past, um, if it's not, um, is there a better way for us to organize our sales to make sure that we're resonating in the fewer moments of truth within the sales cycle? Um, and ultimately, this is accelerating a need for sales leaders to think about rebalancing, reskilling, and ultimately, potentially breaking up away from the, the, the geo-based model that has sort of been the foundation of the last hundred years from a sales standpoint. So this next section, we're gonna go through the, the three sort of phased action steps that Tim referenced. And, and we, we put some timing to these, just this is rough and it may, they may be too short for some of you, maybe too long, and some of you may already be on this journey. Uh, but the first step is really one that's sort of incumbent on all of us as, as we see this the crisis unfolding it's it's looking at our territories and making sure we're rebalancing to drive short-term efficiency what's critical about this is using that process to 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 actually push forward on the realignment the go-to-market realignment the next two we'll talk about so the structural enablement this is about enabling uh the selling into product markets before we even think about coverage and so i we were actually uh, we had a conversation with a sales executive and on this topic and he referenced um, I, I actually think our current coverage can do this verticalization, um, but we need to make sure we figure out how to enable it correctly. And so we'll walk through that. And then we'll talk about how you should be staging your coverage adjustments themselves. So rebalancing territories. So this is, this is the necessary short-term sort of mandate. Um, and what you're dealing with is if you look at the top left here, you have, you have these imbalanced territories, most likely. Um, and what we want to get to is a more balanced territory organization. The primary goal here, which is important to state, is effectiveness, is we want to win as many deals as we can. We don't want sparse territories or overloaded territories. The secondary objective is equitability. Obviously, we have sellers and we want to make sure that there's equitability across territories. So to do this process in the short term, it really starts with adjusting your TAM or your opportunity. So theoretically, your territories are somehow based off of equitable sizing or, or some sort of total addressable market calculation. Well, that has essentially changed over the last few months and it will continue to change. And so making sure you're constantly adjusting your TAM or your opportunity based off what's happening externally within industries is the starting point for this. So you can identify, hey, territory C is going to be starving for a while because it is typically made up of these two industries which are hurting um, so therefore you want to make some adjustments second step is is identifying where there's capacity but then also where there are performance deviations and so it's really a two-part step which is first saying what territories are are starving and which are thriving that's fairly sort of straightforward 
identifying the why, of course, it, it may lead up to an industry um, dynamic, but then also which sellers are struggling and which are succeeding. And so one of the things we've heard from a number of our clients in the financial services industries are that a number of their sellers have been able to adjust to the sort of the telesales, the, the, the online sales uh, process, and a number are struggling. And so as we think about prioritizing opportunities in the short term and driving to efficiency, we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, and of course, over the long run, make sure we're enabling our teams uh, to succeed in the new normal. Third is obviously matching the right capacity to the right accounts. And, and this is really where we begin the process of breaking down those geographic based barriers. So if you think about this structure on the left as being sort of East Coast and West Coast, um, you may want to hand the oppor excess opportunities in territory D to territory B, but the reality is, is the, the rep in territory C may be best equipped to handle those. And so you want to break down the geographic barriers and actually perhaps hand those over. Uh, again, we're trying to get the right opportunities to the right sellers. And of course, in this process, there's going to be short term adjustments to deployment and quota and compensation that need to be aligned accordingly. This is a pretty straightforward process, but the reason why we see this as the first step is that what you've just done is you've actually generated new insights on, on really what are the most important non geographic based success drivers, whether it's sort of the vertical realities, uh, seller expertise or capabilities, and those are what you need to take to the next stage. And as we think bigger picture about, about go to market transformations, there's really four elements that we focus on. The first is products. And so this is the manifestation of, of, of all of your products, the portfolio itself. There's some core solutions, some extensions, there's some, some big bets you're investing in. And ultimately those are mapped typically to, to markets. So this is where you expect to find your, your, your revenue. Um, we often merge these two and, and, and focus on the, the term product markets. So a, a product manifestation or an extension A here might fit large enterprise, but extension B might fit SMB. And so you have different product markets essentially that are defined. What's really important to highlight though is that the third sort of step here or phase is what we look at as enablement. So there's, there's an operational infrastructure side, which is systems and, and, and process and all of that and training and development, which will is important, but we'll put to the side, it's really the program support. So as you think about product markets, the enablement is how am I going to go tackle those product markets? What's the content that I have? What are the solutions I'm bringing? Do I have data-driven targeting to enable me? Uh, and how am I driving that through all the potential channels that will cover it? So coverage in this, in, in this dynamic really comes forth. And there's a reason for that. If you think about focusing on the product markets first, so identifying where your vertical, where your product has a different verticalized manifestation, you can then start to say, okay, what are, what's the enablement that I need to go win on that manifestation? So it is, is our product for healthcare that different than, uh, finance, than other financial services? If the answer is no, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have changes. You may still have a different value proposition to pitch. And so as you begin to think about the different vertical manifestations, it's mapping that to a checklist, if you will, of enablement needs to make sure you're identifying what needs to be skinned differently by vertical to resonate the most. And so we see this as the initial process that most companies should go through once you've done this, it then becomes easier to begin realigning sort of the sales force or the go to market as you begin to roll out new verticals and new positioning. And so what does this look like in reality? This is um, this is an example. And, and so, you know, the context may be different for, for any given industry, but the first phase, if you will, is investing in a vertical IP lead. So now that you've declared a number of product markets that you need to enable, uh, discreetly or, or sort of individually, it's identifying a very specific lead. We it's, you call this an industry specialist. Sometimes it's called an evangelist, and this may be a number of folks or a single individual. But this is the this is the this is the person or the team that will basically bridge the gap between marketing and sales. They will help frame the external positioning and IP towards that industry. Uh, they will help frame the positioning. They will help do the internal training and and, and selling internally. 
uh, and training of the sales reps, and they'll actually help support on, de on, on deals themselves. And so this is the first investment we see most companies needing to make. Again, it may differ by industry or by company, but some manifestation of this. Once you've done that, and, and you start to see the, the, the sort of the efficiency go up or the improvement of, of how you're winning in that particular industry or vertical, you then typically will see a, okay, let's carve out a verticalized sales force uh, with a, within a particular segment. So here we, we've highlighted, you may add a strategic vertical one and an AE rep. And so this would be, this typically is usually in one of three industries, healthcare, federal, uh, or, or other financial services, but it could, it could be anything that you're selling into. But this is really where you're actually beginning the process of verticalizing your sales reps. And it often starts at the top of the pyramid to win some lighthouse accounts or to really show efficiency, you know, at, at the highest end. Once that process unfolds, you start to think about a wash, rinse, repeat of it all. So, um, okay, should we extend that verticalization down into SMB or sort of down our pyramid? Um, are there other verticals that we should be that we should be focusing on? And as you begin to declare those as new product markets enable them, you start to to sort of verticalize um, as you roll those out. This is a typical evolution that we see, and what's important to note is that. You could start with coverage, right? And this is something we see a number of companies do, which is they, they, they declare, hey, I, we know these are the verticals that are different, so we're gonna go change our coverage. But what happens is, is if you don't do that, if you do that before you've actually gone through the process of figuring out what enablement needs to change, the content, the messaging, the positioning, the research itself, um, that coverage change can often fall flat and, and, and result in, you know, limited change in conversion rates, overinvestment in coverage. Now you're maybe perhaps too many overlays or you've just switched everyone around. And, and we've probably all dealt with it at least once in our careers, the oper operational chaos from reorging. And so we typically view supporting the enablement to product markets as the first phase uh, to focus on. Last thing we want to leave with is, is this is this concept of dynamic territories. And so Tim referenced this. Um, and, and really the definition here is, is assigning leads to the right resource post lead creation when we have the context versus what we call static territories, where, where any lead is, is we already know where that where that lead is going before uh, before it's actually created. Um, there is particular relevance for this as you think about sort of middle and down pyramid as well as more likely to be relevant for new business or land. Um, obviously, when you're talking about current accounts, relationships tend to be more important. And so you see perhaps a little less relevance over there. And then obviously, as you move up the pyramid, um, you know, you, you already know the accounts you want to focus on. You already you're, you're, you already know exactly what the top 100 are. And so it, it's less about uh, dynamic routing itself. But this concept really, it can apply across the board, but it's really focused more in the mid market and down and, and typically more on land accounts. But what we're talking about is, is basically as an opportunity, if you think about the left side, as opportunities are created and we have some insight based off their company size, their qualification, we have an estimated size of the opportunity. Uh, we have an industry and, and obviously what we know about our current reps is we have um, capacity. Some are, some are over capacity, some are under capacity. And so the whole concept of dynamic territories is basically no one is given a set of accounts um, or you might be given a set at the beginning of the year, but it changes and fluctuates as new opportunities come in. And based off a number of criteria, you're optimizing where that lead should go. You don't want to send it to a resource that's over capacity. Uh, you also don't want to send it to a resource uh, that doesn't have the specialization needed to close it. And the whole idea here is that you're, you're optimizing profit. You're, you're passing the right, the right deals to the right sellers. Um, theoretically, that drives better win rates. Um, you're actually balancing capacity. Uh, you're getting rid of that, that territory imbalance that we've talked about. And, and ultimately, you're, you're removing a number of cumbersome processes we all deal with, with geographic planning and account lists and territory planning and those kinds of things. And this is, this is a fairly analytical process, but just to highlight, our objective function 
is to maximize the probability of a win. As a sales organization, we want to maximize the probability of a win subject to a number of constraints. Um, and, and so we, we have to do so at a, at a certain profitability threshold. We have some equitability, uh, but ultimately the goal is to maximize the probability of a win. And so we see organizations starting this process. They typically will pilot in a particular revenue segment, perhaps a, tip, a, a, a particular sales function, um, starting with a rules-based kind of model um, based off the, some of those elements of transaction economics, uh, capacity, and then expertise. But then what happens quickly is you can transition that as you start to get the data around what's working and what's not, which sellers are selling and in, in, in which industries, you can actually start to, to drive some more machine learning. And actually we wanna show a, I'll hand it back to Tim to talk about a quick case uh, where we've implemented this with a yeah. client. We'll wrap it up. Yeah, let me go through a really quick case. This is a simple case of dynamic territories. Uh, this is an office product company, mostly in mid-market and SMB. They have an inside sales channel and they're trying to do contract renewals. And the typical way they did contract renewals was, you know, you do the drip marketing campaigns and basically each rep would just look at their territory, kind of bring up which contracts are due for renewal and then decide on their own which ones they would call. And as a result, they were getting poor coverage um, and low conversion because there was no coordination with marketing and there was no prioritization of which opportunities to go after. So what they did, is the following. They took basically, uh, and they would set, by the way, the territories once a year. They basically took all the territories away. And every month they reset the territories for every rep, inside sales rep. They scored and prioritized every opportunity, assigned a new target set of accounts to every map every month based on their industry expertise, their capacity, how well they did last month, uh, et cetera. They then uh, aligned marketing and sales with outreach and a contact strategy each month and then they trap the rep activity against each individual deal that they were fed. So fundamentally, rather than giving them a territory, they basically say, we're gonna feed you leads based on uh, what we think is ready to be sold and what we think your skill is. And we're gonna expect you to go chase those down and we'll see how you do 30 days later. The coverage rate went through the roof in terms of actually getting to the leads that and the opportunities that needed to be covered. The conversion rate um, almost, uh, tripled in some cases, generally a little over double, and the average order size went up by 32%. And the, ba the, the reason why this happened was really simple. You just had greater expertise on, in this case, the phone or uh, remotely than you did by having uh, a local rep who may or may not know that customer's industry, company, et cetera. So it's a very simple process and it, and it doesn't take a lot. You can now see how this might translate into a larger sales organization. This was just a particular SMB slice the market for a particular product. But you can see how if you really decided rather than the lead being assigned or the opportunity being assigned geographically, you're assigning the opportunity totally by skill set and capacity. And it has a huge, huge impact on productivity. So we see three things, real simple. Territory rebalance, price went through that. Where should we deploy our resources? How should we change our territories based on what they were before? Um, we don't like the term sales enablement, honestly, uh, as a second step. Sales enablement typically to most people means training and stuff, but we really believe that you're gonna have a problem if you're trying to go out and train every rep on every product in every industry. So we believe you've got to take a look at what are the structural things you're doing to make your sales teams more productive. It isn't necessarily just workflow automation, more CRM systems. It's actually investment in digital content, vertical product expertise, and analytics as we described before. So that's kind of the second step is how do you not only rebalance your territories, but then once you rebalance and make your sales guys more, more effective. And the last thing you do is change coverage. Rather than just sitting there saying, hey, we're going to put some people in charge of federal or we're going to put some people in charge of healthcare. Don't change the coverage until you've rebalanced the territories and, and improved your sales enablement. Then you can start changing what I would call the 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 the, the uh, you know the the uh, uh, geographic coverage if you've got them or industry coverage. But make sure you've got the territory rebalanced done and make sure you've got some sales effectiveness keys in place before you start redesigning the entire coverage model. Bryce, I'll let you wrap it up from there. We, yeah. uh, we have other presentations and this will be delivered to you, but 
Bryce, why don't you give people an idea of when they'll get that, et cetera? Yeah, so hey, just folks, we understand we're, we're one minute over, so understand if you have to drop. There was one question that came through, um, and so I will ask that quickly, which is, I've typically viewed sales enablement as training and onboarding. It seems like you're discussing a different view. Can you elaborate on the role of sales enablement? And I think, Tim, you just sort of referenced, but um, you want to quickly answer that, and then we'll, we'll wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think too much of sales enablement is viewed as, as training every individual rep on everything. And I believe sales enablement needs to be a technology element to it in terms of putting the, the, the content, the, the scoring, all that type of stuff behind the rep so that rather than reps deciding who they're going to call, when they're going to call, what they're going to say, I would say the top 10% of your reps can do that. The majority of your reps need more enablement and direction. And we believe that that is not satisfied by training as much as it is by uh, investment in customer insight and intelligence. One more question and then we'll wrap. So doesn't this impair the knowledge of the accounts changing account assignments every month or does the industry expertise overcome this challenge? And so I believe this question would be with direct reference to the dynamic territories and I'll, I'll take a first stab and then Tim, you can jump in. But um, yeah, no, so absolutely. When you, when you think about dynamic territories in their pure form, um, you're going to that because uh, you want to optimize capacity and obviously allocate opportunities to the right sellers. Um, there are certainly circumstances, and it could be a whole industry, it could be a market segment where you still need to lean on relationships and knowledge of accounts. And so that's why that concept of dynamic territories has certain application uh, in particular industries and segments. And we do see elements of it sort of being the future for a number of sales organizations. But that's not to say that 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 there aren't going to be circumstances where, uh, you know, knowledge of accounts and relationships matters the most. And and I'd encourage people to ask a simple question: If if account relationship is so critical, uh, why do so many sales reps have less than 20% share of wallet uh, in an account and are selling to less than 30% of the potential buyers? In other words, yes, account is important, but account knowledge doesn't always necessarily drive success knowing the product, knowing the buyer, knowing the situation, knowing the vertical is every bit as important as knowing the account. Great. Uh, well, listen, I know we've got a few minutes over. We appreciate everyone's time. Hope this uh, smart, sparked some uh, interesting insights for you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're obviously happy to, uh, to go deeper on any one topic that we touched on today. Um, and we will reach out uh, probably early next week with the contents, the, the, the webinar recording itself, as well as the presentation for everyone. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.